how secure do you feel financially? I mean, like, how stable are your finances? How, and then on a completely separate but similar note, how content are you with what you have? How secure do you feel financially? How content are you with what you have? Especially in, you know, a season where over the last couple of years, your finances have been all over the place. Your sense of security financially has been like a roller coaster, right? I mean, I can't be the only one that feels that way, right? Where like things, like you went through a season where you thought everything was gonna collapse and then it didn't entirely, at least for some of us, right? Some of you, I mean, you lost an entire business or something. You, you, you thought your job was gonna be gone and then it wasn't, but like it's been up and down and all around and then inflation hits and now if you didn't get, you know, a 20% raise over the last two and a half years, you got a 20% pay cut. And, and which means you're making less, you're ha- you have less, even though you're making the same amount of money. And, and so what that does is you, you begin to feel less secure, less confident. And we were just having a conversation with one of our adult daughters um, about insurance, because now like some of it she has to take care of. And, and as I started going through it, you know, we were just ex- talking about the idea of insurance, how like, it, you know, it's kind of like this, you pay for protection to create security in your life. And you pay for it for everything. Have you ever gone through the list of all of the things? I mean, this is really for those of you that are adulting. The rest of you just wait. They have insurance for everything. And if you actually add it up, it's frightening. I mean, should we go through like a short list? Like we have like car insurance and life insurance and homeowners or renters insurance. And then we have to put things on the homeowners or renters insurance that are valuable because that has to be insured in case your dwelling is gone. And, and then what? We have disability insurance in case something tragic happens, but you're still alive and, uh, and you can't make money. And what, I mean, like it just, it keeps going, right? Like, and then every time you turn on, like you listen, you're hearing more sales pitches about buying more insurance for things you didn't even know you should be scared of losing. Like you get, I guess you can get insurance for your car repairs. And I'm like, somebody smart figured it out. And I guarantee you, you're going to pay more than you're going to ever get back. Like I'm, you can tell I'm a little bit cynical. Um, and what I know is this though, all of those things are like putting, like we're paying for a layer of protection to create security, to safeguard ourselves from like catastrophic financial ruin right? I mean, in that kind of the point. And so like, there's some trade-off of like, yeah, I'm willing to pay that much to make sure that if something terrible happens to my health, that I'm not stuck with like a $10 million bill that I'll never be able to pay off. Okay. And so um, we, 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 we're looking for financial security and stability in a world that is entirely not stable in an economy that's entirely not stable. And so there's this struggle, right? If you don't feel like you have enough, which almost everybody feels like, but let's say things are really tight, then you're working really hard trying to get more. Or maybe you've done well for yourself and you're stressed working hard to keep what you have and get more. And then there's a small group of people that they've, you know, they've, they've made it. They've either, maybe they've worked really hard or they've inherited or things have just gone well for them. And they've got more than enough financially, but they don't feel like it's enough because there's some deep void in them. And so they're always doing things to fill something that all the things they have don't fill. And by the way, just so you know, I'm not just up here saying something that you're going through. I mean, I, I feel this too. Um, I was thinking, you know, how much do I share of this? But like, you know, I get the privilege of being your pastor, but part of being the lead pastor of Lifehouse also means that like, for those of you that are like business owners, you get this, like, I'm also like the guy in charge. And which, what I mean by that is like, I'm the, I carry the weight to, of, you know, like we have staff and we've got payroll and there's a mortgage and there's a lease payment in, in Chambersburg and there's a rent payment in Frederick. And like, and it all, shockingly, it all seems to come every two weeks or once a month. And like, there's insurance to be paid. And then there's a crazy water bill that seems to never stop going up. You know, like there's electric payments. And, and, and so I feel that. And then here's the thing. If you're feeling it, we're feeling it because as inflation went up, you know what happened? Simultaneously giving dropped 
directly proportional to that. And so uh, no matter where the giving is, right? Like we, we got to still make payroll. And we got to still pay the mortgage and that. And so like, I, I feel that we feel that we have a financial team. And, um, and so like, I'm aware that if you're wrestling, so are we. And so I'm just saying like, we feel it too. And things are tight, right? Things are tight for you. Things are tight inside, right? Because um, for the church, like we, we had narrowing margins and we're trying to do more. I mean, we're reaching more people with less. And I'm not saying that to complain. I thought, you know, I, I thought, well, I can share that because one, then you know where we're at. And then also too, like there's a connection where you go, yeah, we get, we get this together. Like we're, we're all in this. And, and here's the thing. I think at some point, if you pause and slow down, you start to ask questions. You start to think things like, is this supposed to be this way? Like, am I supposed to endlessly carry stress about the finances? Like, and I thought that and I'm like, and I'm the pastor and I'm stressed. Like probably my, probably like my second prayer. If I have a prayer list, like I pray for our community, I pray for the mission of the church, and then I'm praying for the finances. And it stresses me out, it wears me down, it keeps me up at night, it gets me up in the morning. And, and, so I, and then I, at some point I go like, I, is this supposed to be this way? Like, are we supposed to endlessly feel overwhelmed and challenged and, and frustrated about finances? And it doesn't matter whether you don't have it, whether you have very little, you have enough, or you have too much. Like, it seems like everybody is stressed by it. And overwhelmed by it. And so we start to go, I, like, I wonder if there's a better way. So I want to bring you to a story. You know, we've been going through the story of Job in, in the Bible, uh, which is a really unique story. Um, I won't give you the whole background again, but it, the, suffice to say, the story of the book of Job is uh, 42 chapters. Most of it's conversation, and three chapters are the narrative of a guy who, when it starts, he's got it all. In essence, you could say he's figured out the better way. I mean, he's got a great life, and we're going to dive in for a moment on like kind of how you could say he's got a great life. Um, Job chapter 1 begins with like this idea of just like, here's how great things are going for Job. Job chapter one, we're going to go verse three. He owns 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, which doesn't mean much to us. Uh, but when you keep reading, he's got five, you know, he's got 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. Like most people would have like one set of oxen, right? To work their small little piece of land. He's got 500 of those. He's got thousands of sheep, thousands of camels, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants, meaning he's running a really large business. Does that make sense? He's, he's uber wealthy. He, he's the Elon Musk of the ancient world, okay? Um, okay, and, and, and so where did this all come from? In fact, it continues and just simply says, he was the greatest man among all the people of the East, so everybody knows his name. They, they know him. He's the one with all of the financial resources. He, he's got, he's living the, the good life. And then uh, the, his enemy, not a physical, not, not like a human, but like the, the enemy of his soul, Satan, goes to God and is explaining to God why he's got it so good. He goes like this. This is verse 9 and 10. He goes, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him? Meaning, haven't you put like a covering around Job's life, his finances? You, you put a hedge around him, his household, and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hands. Meaning, God, you've put your favor on his business. You put your favor on his finances. You put your favor on his workers, on his company, on his profits. I want that. So that his flocks and herds are spread throughout all the land. And, and so basically what the enemy does is says, God, the only reason why he, he serves you and loves you is because you're taking such good care of him. If you took it all away, he would curse you. So God allows Satan to do that. Now, we don't know, we don't ever get an answer. In fact, the whole story is Job arguing with friends about why God does what he does. So if you've ever asked hard questions, if you've ever asked why are things the way they are, why are my finances the way they are, your, your words are in the book of Job. Because the book of Job is not a story about what happened to Job. It's a story about what happens to us. And so he's wrestling with this stuff, and we're going to get to some of it uh, in this message. But what you find out is tragedy strikes. 
In verse 14 and 15, we get a quick glimpse. It says, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. I mean, these, these bandits, the, these bar, uh, barbarians came and they stole everything and they made off with them. They put the servants to the sword. They killed all of your employees, except me. I, I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And then, and then the story continues in verse 16 and 17. It says, Another messenger shows up and says, fire came out of the sky and burned up all of your flocks, burned up all of these. And then other robbers came and stole all of your other animals and killed all of your other employees. Like basically in a matter of hours, Job finds out that every business he owns went bankrupt. Every building he owns burned down and everybody who works for him is gone. You thought you had a bad day. You thought you had a tough week. This guy has one really, really bad day. And so what happens when it all falls apart? I mean, you have all this insurance around you, you have these, or maybe you don't, but somehow there's always a loophole. There's always a way for things to go worse. And, and you just, you can't safeguard against that. And for Job, that's where, he, you know, the enemy found the loophole and everything collapsed. And Job responds this way. And we're going to really look at the, the message and the meaning in this, in these verses, verse 20 and 21. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I'll depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He goes, God, I came into this world with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. You give, you take. I'm going to worship you. Can I just gulp for a moment? Because I struggle with that. Because there's a lot in between. I came with nothing and I'm going to leave with nothing. There's a lot in between the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed is the name of the Lord. But there's a lesson, and I hope that I can deposit this not just into your ears or it stick in your mind, but it deposits into your heart. What, what, is, what is Job saying? And, he, and he, what he's saying is true. I mean, this is the right response. It's a hard response, but it's a right response. What he's saying in essence is this. God, you own everything. So I'm going to trust you with everything. You're in full control, so I'm going to give you control. The lesson for you and I, while we're busy trying to put layers of security around every aspect of our life that never actually makes sure it keeps us secure, what we can do is this. Since God owns everything, I'm going to trust him with everything. What would it mean for you to believe that God owns everything? Therefore, you're going to trust him with everything. What would it mean for you to trust God with everything? Now, here's the challenge. The reason why we get stuck in a trap of working harder and harder and harder to try to get more and more and more to get ahead and protect what we have and strive to get those things that we've always wished because here's the thing. Here's why. Because we we have broken desires and we live in a broken world. Let me explain. Our broken desires... Something is not right 100% inside of us. Now, you could look at me and say, yeah, that's true, Patrick. Something's not right inside of you. But it's true for you too, okay? Let, let's just say this. We all have broken desires. What that means is something is fractured in us that causes us to believe what isn't true. We believe that things can satisfy us. We have broken desires. Our desires should be for God. But there's this spiritual corruption inside of us that breaks us and causes us to believe that things that won't make us happy will make us happy. And we go pursuing with broken desires things that will break us rather than satisfy us. And because we have broken desires and we live in a broken world, it doesn't work. Meaning, the broken world is that nothing will satisfy. We have a broken, you know, we have a broken economy. We have a broken political system. We live in broken relationships in a broken city. And that's not me calling anybody out, right? Like this is true no matter where you live, no matter what the world looks like, we live in a broken world, meaning nothing satisfies. So we have broken desires in a broken world as a result of a spiritual curse called sin, separation from relationship with God, where we want to do the things that don't make us happy. 
that won't satisfy us. And so we go looking for it, but it doesn't work. And so we turn to books like Job for hope and help. When you go through the story of Job, there's this like, there's like a really long argument between Job and his friends. Job is like doubting God and questioning God and arguing with God. And his friends are arguing with him and they're giving him, frankly, he calls them miserable comforters. He goes, thanks. What you're saying doesn't help. Because they're trying, to, they're trying to convince him of who God is and the way God works, but they misrepresent God. Like they say things like, well, God's punishing you or God's correcting you. This is from God because you've sinned. And Job's like, what are you talking about? And then they, and then they say things like, Job, you just need to believe. Maybe you just need to work harder. Maybe you just need to get a job. I mean, they give all the wrong answers when things are not going well. And do you have people in your life like that? When things don't go well, maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's one of those like miserable friends. They're not happy and they want to make sure you're not happy too. And they just, they, they say things that actually make it worse, not better. That's Job's friends. But then when you jump ahead to Job chapter 38, there's this verse that changes the whole tone of the argument. And it, it, it's this, it, it reads like this, verse, verse one of chapter 38 says, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. God showed up and God began to speak. Now, what's interesting is when you read those chapters, God never answers Job's questions, but God does speak. And that verse alone, you know what God's answer to our darkest and hardest questions are? He doesn't actually answer with just words. He enters into the storm. That's what God does. It says that God spoke to him from, from out of the storm, meaning God goes into the storm and then speaks to him out of the storm. Like God's in it with him. You know what God did? God entered into our brokenness. God entered into our messiness. Jesus didn't come a king in a palace. He came a servant born in poverty. God entered into it. Jesus takes on the posture of a servant. He lives the life of a, of a, of a, of a pauper. It's the prince and the pauper, right? The, the, the son of God becomes the son of man and he lives in destitute. He dies a criminal's death. Why? Because it's what we deserved. Jesus takes on our curse of sin, that, that sin nature that drives us away from God toward what isn't best. Jesus takes, that deserves eternal punishment. So Jesus takes it on himself and he dies in our place, taking on our eternal death sentence once for all so that anyone who believes in Jesus is forgiven. Their sin guilt removed. Their eternal judgment Paid in full by Jesus Christ as he died on the cross. But Jesus didn't just die. He rose from the dead victorious over the grave. Why? Because he entered into death and then spoke victory out of the grave. He entered into our sin and then spoke victory and salvation. He, see, he entered into the storm and then overcame it for us. That anyone who believes in Jesus is forgiven. So really, regardless of your financial situation, you have, you've been trapped right? You, you've been trapped with broken desires in a broken world, and the answer is not a financial plan, as good as that is. The answer is not a better job, as good as that is. The answer is a person, Jesus, who entered into our storm and then speaks life out of the storm. And if that's where you're at today, and you're ready to begin a new life with Jesus, would you, just, would you say yes to Jesus by faith? Put your faith in him and believe in him. And if you're making that commitment, would you let someone know? Would you let us know? We put a QR code on the screen. We do this each week because we would encourage you, for those of you that are saying yes to Jesus, let us know because we want to cheer you on. We want to give you resources. We want to help you as you begin this new journey in relationship with God. So scan it, fill out the form. Pastor Spencer here will follow up with you. We have a team that will follow up with you if you're joining us online. Now you've said yes to Jesus and now everything is great. All your financial woes are gone. No, let me be very clear. That's a lie. And any church or any pastor or any book or any podcast that tells you otherwise is a lie. There are, there is a strand of Christianity that tries to tell you that if you had enough faith, you'll have it all. Man, you have a better house, you have a better, better car, you have all the money you want. That's, that's a lie. Really, because I mean, 11 of the 12 
apostles of Jesus were murdered, were put to death, destitute. And one of them was put as a prisoner on an island till he died. So like, that's pretty hard to justify. No, the promise is not that you're going to have it all in this life. The promise is that you'll have it all forever in relationship with Jesus, in eternity, in heaven. In this life, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have challenges. But what lesson can we learn about how to live our life with a sense of financial stability, a sense of financial security, knowing that just because you believe in Jesus, you are not going to have all the security that you want. Let's jump back into the story. If you go over to Job chapter 24, Job is answering his friends, and he's trying to make this point that if you trust yourself, things will collapse. You have to trust God with everything you have. And so it reads this way, Job chapter 24, verse 22, and he goes like this, but God drags away the mighty by his power, meaning God shows the powerful that their power won't save them. Though they become established, meaning they create security in their lives, they have no assurance of life. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. He, he's making this point that basically God does not want us to depend on ourselves or trust ourselves. He doesn't want the powerful to trust their power or the wealthy to trust their wealth. What does God want us to trust? Well, here's the point, right? He owns it all. So I have to trust that he knows what's best. I, he owns it all. So he I trust that he knows what I need. He, he owns it all. It's all his. In essence, everything is his, so I have to trust him with everything. He, he owns it all, so I have to trust that he knows what I need when I need it. That's what he's got. Don't trust your power. Don't trust your degree. Don't trust your, your position. Don't trust your ability to influence things. Don't try to control the world around you. You know who we trust? We trust God. He goes, would you rely on him? Because if you try to create your own sense of assurance in life, you know that that's not going to make you very secure. Because your, your feeling is like it's all just a house of cards. And if you get knock out one little piece, it all collapses. But God does not build in your life a house of cards. Right, Jesus tells a story about the man who, who trusts in Jesus as the rock. And he says, like a man who builds his house on a solid foundation, right? Anything else is sand. If we're building it on our own sense of insurance or assurance or security, it's going to collapse. But when I build my life trusting that he owns it all, he knows exactly what I need. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God owns it all? He knows exactly what you need. He is taking care of you. You're at the center of his attention. He loves you. He is for you. He has entered into your storm. In essence, you're not carrying all the weight. Now, this is important. I want you to hear this. Because go back to the whole idea that we have broken desires in a broken world and there is this curse on our lives without Jesus. Remember, the, one of the themes of this series is that everything about the curse of sin is, re is reversed through Jesus. Which means even financial Feelings of financial insecurity are a part of that curse, right? Nothing satisfies. Nothing makes me happy. Jesus takes that curse and he reverses it. How? How does that make sense? Here's what God does. Every time you put your eyes on something, you go, that will make me happy. That will satisfy me. Getting that job, getting that degree, getting that, that new opportunity, getting that new car, getting that better house, that bigger house, getting that new thing, right? And we start to pursue it. How does God reverse the curse? Because he'll let you chase it. And after you sink your teeth into it and it doesn't satisfy, he's reversing the curse. You know what he's doing? He's reminding you, you were not made for this world Nothing in this world will make you happy. You were made for another world. You're not home yet. He reverses the curse. And what it does is every time that happens, because it's happened to you, right? Right? You bought something, you were super excited, and you were like, I, and you put so much thought and energy and research, you were searching online, and you spent a significant amount of time, and then you got it. And within a day or two, you were like, 
Really? It loosens your grip. You start to realize this stuff doesn't satisfy. That's reversing the curse. You start to let go a little bit. You start to let go of this world. You start to let go of this stuff. You start to let go of needing and wanting and demanding more and more and more. And that's God's way of reversing the curse in your heart by showing you nothing in this world will satisfy. You are made for another world. Don't put your treasure in this life. And when you stop putting all of your treasure in this life, then you're able to begin to switch and go, oh, he owns it all. He gives me exactly what I need. Think about what Satan says to God about Job. He goes, you blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout all the land. God, you're taking care of him. It's funny how even Satan knows that God is looking out for us. He knows it. God's looking out for you. He tries to weaponize it. He tries to use it against us. Now, Job's response is this, when he loses it all. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Whether I have much or little, God, I trust you. Whether you're giving or taking, God, I trust you. Your name be praised where I am. You, you've met my needs. You're taking, I mean, isn't that what Thanksgiving is about? We're going to celebrate a time of saying, God, thank you. Whether I have little or much, thank you. God, I have you. You're more than enough. Whatever is spread in front of you this Thanksgiving, here's what you do. I get Jesus and all of this too. I have Jesus and turkey. I have Jesus resurrection life, eternity, and stuffing, and cranberry, and yams, and pumpkin pie. I am rich beyond my wildest imagination. God reminds Job. uh, If you jump into Job 38, God is reminding Job that he's in control. He goes, Job, look, you don't even worry about the things that I think about. He goes, do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? When they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket, are you worried about whether the lion catches a gazelle? Who provides food for the raven? This is not a shout out to Ravens fans. Come on. (laughs) But God is concerned about the well-being of ravens. Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for the lack of food? God's saying, look, I'm looking out for you. It means that I trust that he knows best what I need and I rely on him to provide for my needs. I rely on God to take care of me. How do I do that? I I do what's right. In fact, if you go back, Job makes a point of, here's the things you can do wrong that get you out of God's blessing. Here's the kind of things you can do that will curse your finances. Want me to give you a quick flyover of that? Meaning, here's some warnings. Job, everything went wrong. It all fell apart, and it wasn't his fault. You can make it your fault. You want me me to give you uh, a couple examples of this? Um... Hang on, I feel like I jumped ahead and I got out of line here. So I'm, I'm going to read. Here, here's, here's what J- Satan says about Job. This is God's favor. And then I'm going to show you the things you can do wrong to get out of this, right? J- Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a protection, a hedge of protection around him, his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands. His flocks, his herds are spread throughout the land. So as he gets, you've taken care of everything. Now, Job goes, but you can get out of God's blessing. You can get out from underneath the protection of God. How? So Job 31 verse 5 and 6, he says this. He's trying to give some indication of the things you can do to get out of God's blessing. He goes like this. If I have walked with falsehood, if if you're lying and you're cheating, you're going to get out of God's blessing. Or my foot hurried toward deceit. Let God weigh me in honest scales and he will know that I am blameless. And then he continues, he goes, if I have denied the desires of the poor, if I'm not looking out for those with less, 
I'm not, I, instead of being blessed, I'm going to be cursed. Or let the eyes of the widow grow weary. If I have kept my bread to myself, he goes, if I've only took, taken care of my own needs, if I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or need or needy without garments and their hearts did not bless me from warming them with the fleece of my sheep, he goes, me, if I didn't take care of those with less, I'm going to get out from underneath God's blessing and God's protection. And then he has one final challenge. He goes, if I put my trust in gold, Or said to pure gold, you are my security. He goes, if I trusted in anything else, then I could understand that I'd be outside of the blessing of God. When you jump ahead to the end of the story, the point is this. That there are things you can do to get out from underneath God's favor and blessing. But for Job, he did everything right and everything went wrong. But in the middle of that, he continued to take a posture of God, you give, you take, I trust you. And I worship you. The end of the story reads like this. It's simply uh, chapter 42, verse 10. It goes, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. And the point is not like, yay, God gave everything back, right? Because he still lost so much. Yes, God blessed him. But the point is, God gives, God takes, God, I trust you. And so the challenge I want to give you as I bring this message in for a landing is this. God takes full responsibility for those who fully trust him. Do you hear that? Let, let, me, let me give that to you again. God will take full, re, full responsibility for those who fully trust in him. You want God to take full responsibility for your career path, for your life, for your finances, for your retirement? Trust him fully. Give it all to him. Don't don't put your trust in your ability to manage the market, your ability to manage your own well-being, your ability to to, to, uh, figure out how to get that next contract, your ability to work your way up the ladder. No, you put your full trust in God and say, God, I'm going to trust you, and he takes full responsibility for us. I want to take a moment. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you. I want to pray over your business, your finances, your, 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 your direction you're in right now. Some of you, you've been carrying the weight of the world and you need to let go of that and give it to God. I understand. Some of you, you've been walking through financial crises and you've, just been, you've been feeling burdened and overwhelmed. I want to pray for you. We have a prayer team. My goodness, ask somebody for prayer. But could you give that to God right now? He wants to take full responsibility for you, but you got to fully trust him. Jesus, we're going to give it to you. Our business, our burdens, the financial weight that we carry, trying to figure it all out, trying to make sense of it all. God, every worry, every doubt, every stress, every need, every want, God, we're giving it to you right now. We're saying, God, would you take full responsibility as we fully trust in you with this? God, would you meet every need? I am praying for blessing and prosperity and increase over individuals in our church. God, not so they can have more, but so that, God, they can give more. God, would you bless them so they could be a blessing? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, would you give me permission just for a few moments? I, I want to switch gears, and I do want to talk about the miracle offering. I feel like this would be a good segue, right? Does that make sense? We talked about trusting God and, and, and we do this one time a year as Pastor Spencer so uh, you know, accurately shared. What, what the miracle offering is this. The, here's the idea. Throughout the whole year, we encourage people to give to kingdom builders. It's what we do outside of the church. It's, it's church planting efforts. We, we just launched Reset Church, and actually it cost us very little. Our cost is coming over the next two years. And so we got to resource them over the next two years as they get going, because that was just a different story. We have several churches that we've helped launch. We've got churches that we're helping support coming up here. We've got local outreaches that we resource. That's what we do with For Our City efforts. And as we go into the, um, the Christmas season, we have significant outreaches. We're going to be partnering with Reach, with the Hope Center. We've got big Christmas outreaches. That, it costs money to help resource those things. Um, we've got some other local community out projects that we're working on. And so we've got a list of all these things that are like, they still need to be funded. And so what? here's what I feel, to be honest with you. Um, it, it's like... Sometimes I feel like the weight is on me to figure out how we're going to pay for all that stuff. And so what I do is I'm like, it's like me putting all my weight on one cup, right? And like, you know, that doesn't work. And some of you, you know that because you feel that at work. 
And I want you to know our goal for this miracle offering is to raise $100,000. And if any one of you feel that way, you're like, that's this. It doesn't work. You can't, you know, no little plastic cup isn't going to carry my weight. But what we believe is this, the part, why we call it a miracle offering is we're asking everybody to give their best gift. We know that you're all in different places. We know some of you can't give anything. It's okay. Here, here's what we want to do. We want to invite you to participate. And participating, Spence, you ready for me? No, you're good. You're going. You're going out. It. It's taking its time. All right. Let me, let me explain a little bit. Here, here's the deal, right? We, we believe that when everybody participates, it, it, it carries the weight. Now, hopefully it doesn't collapse on me. But uh, he, here's the point, right? We're trying to raise $100,000 to go to all those different projects as we get toward the end of the year. And the miracle offering is like the one time where we invite everybody to bring their best gift. And if it works, what it does is it means that we all together, Spence, don't, don't put any weight on me. All right, here we go. I, I did eat a bagel this morning, so. All right, we pulled it off, right? So the, that's the point, right? Like, the, the point is, that not any one of us can do, you know, and maybe, and you can. If you can write the $100,000 check, trust me, there's more significant opportunities that we're not resourcing, but we believe that we can all spread it out, right? We can all carry the weight together. Would you give your best gift, what you can do? You know, how, it's shared sacrifice, not shared, not shared amounts. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask everybody to participate. Everybody get out of the chair and drop an envelope in, in the giving boxes. If you're not giving anything, but you want to give, you can just write that down. You can pray for us. Prayer changes things. If you, if you want to give, but you're not ready to give, you can write down, I'm making a commitment to give this. Maybe... Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, this is a lot of talk about money and giving, and now they're asking me to give, and I'm a little irritated by that. That's okay. We get that. Here's why. What I want you to do if you're in that posture is look around at why a whole bunch of people who are all on the roller coaster of up and down financially, some who have very little are willing to sacrifice and give. Because what you'll see is that the Christian community is a generous community who wants to give rather than take. And that's what you're part of. So can I take a moment? I'm going to pray over our miracle offering. And then Pastor Spencer's going to come and give very specific instructions as you prepare to give. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege we have of being part of what you're doing. God, today as we, we give to this miracle offering, this one time a year where we give our best gift into this opportunity, Lord, I pray that you would meet us here, that you would bless, that you would prosper this. God, that you would do more with our little than we could ever do with much. Lord, we're asking that you would show up and truly do miracles among us. Would you show up? For those that give, Lord, I pray blessing over them. I pray that you'd meet their needs. In Jesus' name, amen.